And good morning, church. Merry Christmas to you. Welcome to Only First Methodist Church, where we exist to get you connected and go deeper with Jesus Christ. It's all about Him, amen? It's always going to be about Him, amen? amen? We're glad you're with us today. Hey, just some things that are going to be changing up. Um, uh, our worship team has uh, just been pouring themselves out since, uh, since before uh, the pandemic. Uh, the COVID dimensions, and uh, we're looking to roll them into just one service for them at the 1015 service. And so we're still going to have an 8 o'clock, but it's going to look a little different. And uh, we're looking for a song leader for an 8 o'clock service. So uh, just to take a look at that. So if you feel called to help lead singing, honestly, you don't want me to lead singing. I can give you wonderful examples, but, you know, okay. So we're looking at that. So in the next couple of weeks, things are going to be changing. We're going to uh, shift our Facebook Live to 1015 and not at 8 o'clock. So, uh, but we're going to keep that going right now for another couple of weeks. Both, in fact, both services being Facebook Live. So, okay. So just be in prayer about that. We're really glad you're with us uh, this time, uh, the first day after uh, after Christmas, the, the, the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ being given to you. For without it, you know, you don't have anything else. We don't have a happily ever after. It's all about him and him getting in here. Amen. We got some more stories about that today. On their announcements, hey, we're reading the Bible through in 2022. Um, uh, one of the books we're using is the Daily Walk Bible. It's a great, great uh, Bible. It's got good commentary and things on like that. We've ordered, I don't know, about um, 40 of them, 45 of them. We can order some more. We're starting next Sunday, when, uh, and this, all the sermons we're going to have are going to come over, come out of the scriptures you've been reading in the previous week, the previous week. Uh, we're also going to have in the bulletin an outline about uh, read from here to here uh, throughout the week. So you'll be able to, if you don't have a daily walk Bible, you can use your other Bible that you have and uh, keep up with us. But again, uh, something happens when the Word of God, when we actually get into the Word of God. And because uh, we are called to be in the Word, to know the Word, to live the Word, and breathe the Word. Amen. So we're looking forward to that. A couple of the Bibles are still out there with your name on them if you have uh, uh, registered them. So we look forward to that. Other thing is we're going to start, as we have the last three years, the first 14 days of the year, 14 days of prayer and fasting. Um, Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray. When you fast, not if you fast. Jesus said some of these things cannot be broken off or victorious except through fasting. So uh, we are going to invite you to spend the first two weeks of the new year uh, taking some times of the day, uh, pressing into deeper prayer, and also uh, fasting. Some people uh, give up one meal. Some people fast the entire 14 days. and Just pray about it. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you the direction that you feel called. And Because uh, we need breakthroughs, don't we? Our nation needs breakthroughs. Our families need breakthroughs. Our world needs breakthroughs. And... Um, we're going to do our best to keep pushing through and standing in the gaps. Amen? Amen. So we look forward to that. <sighs> well, shall we stand? Shall we begin worshiping the Lord? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity of being in your house. Papa, you are our audience. We ask you, Lord, to incline your ear down to us. As it says in Psalm 86, bend down, Lord, and hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for Holy Spirit to come, Lord, your ministering and warring angels to come and, and uh, just minister to people, and walk the aisles and uh, touch the other churches and touch our community and uh, be in people's houses and their cars, or how, wherever they find themselves. Lord, we just pray, Lord, for your mercy and grace be extended as far as the east is to the west. As those cry out to you, Lord, this morning and the mornings to come. So, Lord, let us lift our voices as we sing. Let your anointing fall upon us. In Jesus' strong and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
God, as we continue to lift our voices and our hearts up to you, just continue, Lord, to touch, Lord. We desire more of you, deeper waters. In your Son, Jesus, strong name we pray. Amen. God is good and all the time. He turned to somebody and said, Merry Christmas. Look at him and say, we love you. We need you. We're glad you're with us this morning. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 As we uh, come together in a time of prayer and um, sharing our heart, uh, we want to lift up the uh, house of Smallwood this morning. And as uh, Joanne has uh, gone uh, to be with the Lord and leaving on Friday evening, and uh, she always had such kindness and the light of Christ shining out of her, and uh, just uh, she just wanted to be with with her Jesus, and she is. And uh, so many of our loved ones who've gone before have just uh, also are experienced just the oneness of what it be to be in Christ's presence. Amen. So we just want to lift up Dean and the family. And uh, well done, good and faithful servant as Joanne is and will continue to be. Also, I'd like for you to lift up my niece, Megan. She's 30 years old. Um, she is a special needs child, and she has her second battle with cancer. She has cancer in her back in several places and other problems, and the medicines that she's on have major complications. If you would continue to lift her up in prayers. We want to lift up those who are in our prayer list and our bulletins there and praying over them this morning and just asking God to continue to touch and move and pushing back all the dimensions of the, the COVID and, and situations. I, uh, I, I had a, a situation last Saturday, maybe I shared this with you, I just stopped to see some friends down in a metropolis and they have just one of the most fantastic granddaughters. Uh, she's an excellent marksman with the bow and she's, uh, she's won uh, major competitions as a sophomore in high school reads a book a day and just is a brainiac but she has in her mind a great fear of covid that it's absolutely paralyzed her and when she gets around people if someone's not wearing a mask from a distance she just becomes very hysterical and this is kind of the situations we found our, find ourselves is that uh, this co constant fear and and a changing of, of this line and that line and, and uh, the, you know, we know what's going on, but it's having a major impact on, on lots of people. And this young lady, is just, she's paralyzed. And we're just praying for people that are caught up in that. I mean, COVID is real. You know, 
I've had some friends and uh, who who have, who have passed uh, from from COVID, and uh, we respect uh, we respect the the situation that's out there. But we're not going to live in fear because perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. And it does. Perfect love of Christ casts out all fear, and we're not going to face this hiding. We're going to just stand firm and. We're going to actually follow the science. People say they follow the science, and then you look at the science, and you're just wondering, I don't think you're following the science. So, uh, again, uh, I, don't, I don't know where you are on things. I know where some of you are. And we just want to make sure that uh, we keep Jesus. It's our King, our Lord. He's fighting for us. Amen. So we just want to lift up those who continue to struggle, and also with other health issues and dimensions, and uh, those who find... This time of the year also very hard because uh, the chair is empty, the phone is not going to ring, a letter will not arrive. So we just want to lift up all of you that uh, um, are, celebrate this time of Christmas, of Jesus' birth with a, with, a, with a heaviness in your heart. So let's go to the Lord in a time of stillness, followed by our fellowship prayer and then our Lord's prayer. And if you happen to have a prayer request... If there's a prodigal son and daughter that's heavy on your heart or if there's a special need, we invite you to stand or even come up to the kneeling rail to pray. and We will press in also with you um, because we serve a big God. We serve a big God who does answer prayers. So let's go to the Lord in a time of stillness followed by our fellowship prayer. Papa, we just come before you. We give you thanks and praise, Father God, in your love and your great mercy. Lord, may we keep our eyes upon you, no matter what the storms are that are, right, or that are rising up. Lord, as the message came on Christmas Eve uh, of Emmanuel, M N U L, that God is with us in the storms, God is with us. When things don't go right, God is with us through the good and the bad. The darkest time you've had in your life, friends, God is, was still with you. He does not abandon. And although we will walk away or nibble ourselves away from him, the Lord is always there with his arms to welcome us back. And heaven is cheering on that we will press in for the prize. And we thank you, Lord, for this year, this year of uh, being stretched and being in your work, and some things getting cut out of our lives that were interfering from us from hearing from you and going deeper with you. And we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to stand here today in this house, Lord, with this family of God, joining our hearts together and your Holy Spirit being poured in. We just give you thanks. We give you praise. Touch, Lord, those who have heavy burdens on their hearts. We ask you, Lord, to, to, to bring your healing. Touch, Lord, upon those that are crying out to you today. We pray, Lord, for those prodigals that are out there, that they will understand that, that, Jesus, you came as a child, but you died as a mighty man of God, the mighty man of God, upon that cross so they can come home, that we can have a happily ever after, and it's available for all. So as we join our hearts in prayer, to pray that prayer as Jesus taught us, fall upon us, Lord. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Deep calling a deep, spirit to spirit. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You can never go wrong with reading the word, and this is the Christmas time, but you know, the, the Christmas stories are there, but the, the foundation is still the foundation. St. Paul, who wrote uh, a large part of the New Testament, is going to, Lisa's going to share with us his reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then I'm going to begin my message with uh, continuing the reading in 1 Corinthians 15. So let us hear about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power that's there for us. I invite you to please stand for the reading of the Holy Word of God from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Do you have any kids this morning for a children's moment? You guys want to come up? All right. Amen. Hey, we can just sit right here. Hi. Okay, you can sit there. Hi, guys, girls. Good to see you. Hi. What in the world is that? Hey, I got a question. You know, we were talking about this on Christmas Eve. Talking about it. Huh? Okay. Tell me, what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get for Christmas? What'd you get? Um, a truck. A truck? Okay. What'd you get? Um, a T-Rex. A T-Rex? I thought they were extinct. What did you get? Toys, girls, way over here, another time zone. What'd you guys get? What'd you get for Christmas? Are you guys always quiet? No. <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Isn't it nice to get things? Isn't it wonderful to get things? Now, my, my next question you need to ask, what did you give Jesus for his birthday? What did you give him? What did you give G? What, what did you, what, what did you give Jesus for his birthday? What did you, what did you give G? Wasn't it his birthday? And don't we get stuff? What, what, what did we give Jesus? Sadly, that's very true in a lot of things. But you know, we can, in a way, give Jesus a gift if we allow him to come into our heart. That's what he loves about it. He says, if you let me in, oh, that's what pleases him. Brings a smile upon his heart and in heaven. So it's great that we celebrate Jesus and it's great that we remember each other and give each other gifts and everything. But the most important thing is Jesus came 
so we could receive the greatest gift. Amen? And that gift is him in our heart and eternal life. Amen? So, I hope you guys have a great, great weekend and you continue having fun with your T-Rex and your silence. (laughs) Father, God bless these young men, young ladies. We thank you, Lord, for their life. We thank you, Lord, for the the joy that they bring to our hearts. We just ask your blessing upon them as we remember what Christmas is truly about and the great gifts that we have available that make you smile and make heaven rejoice. Amen? And you can return back to your seats. guy's going to go down to children's church. There they are. There they are. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, of uh, being able to bless your kingdom work back. We ask your blessing upon the gathering of these tithes and offerings. Continue to lift up those, Lord, who are suffering, who are in great poverty, especially those that uh, we are fresh in our memories about those who are in Kentucky and Missouri and other places that have been just devastated by the tornadoes, but other disasters that are out there here and around the world. So, Lord, we pray, Lord, for your provision. As we are faithful to give our tithes and offerings to you, Lord, for you to touch, bless, and multiply these gifts and the gift givers. And those, Lord, who are struggling and can't, we ask you, Lord, a special unction fall upon them. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Search the end to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so in a manger filled with hay, God's only son was born.
baby boy would grow to be a man and one day die for me and you. My sins would drive the nails in you. That rugged cross was my cross. Choose to live. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Word of God. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12, the resurrection of the dead. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Jesus from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain and you are still stuck in your sin. In that case, all who have died believing in Jesus are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than any other people in the world. But if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, he is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And just as everyone dies because we are all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given, be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Her name is Catherine Coleman. Powerful evangelist, anointed woman of God. Healing ministries. Very powerful in the 50s and the 60s. People would go to her meetings in need of a physical healing. And many times they'd leave with that actually happening. She wrote a book. The book was called, or one of her books was, God Can Do It Again. And in it there are stories about miracles and breakthroughs that she shares. And I'd like to share with you a story that begins a few days before Christmas in 1961. It's a story written by a woman whose name is Dora Lutz. And she writes in this book, When the Bow Breaks, and a story of great tragedy, but God can bring something even out of the most darkest of times. Dora writes, it was just four days before Christmas, and the last present was wrapped and carefully hidden in the basement. A light snow was falling across the Ohio countryside, and Joe glanced out the kitchen window as he gulped his off-to-go-to-work cup of coffee, and he said, It looks like a white Christmas for sure, honey. I moved across the room and stood with my arm around his waist, and we both drank in the beautiful scene through the window. The rolling fairways of the golf course behind our house, 
is covered with a soft blanket of pure white snow. A gentle snow drift drifted down and collected on the limbs and upon the spruce pine that stood outside the window. I gently squeezed his waist and said, have another cup of coffee, honey. He says, oh, no, got to run, dear. Joe said he had to begin to, uh, to, he began to put on his coat. He says, weather like this means there's lots of work for television repairmen. He kissed her on the cheek and started for the door when he heard the boys coming down the stairs. It was their first day home from school for Christmas vacation. Mikey, eight years old, full of energy and enthusiasm, came running into the kitchen and jumped on the chair and he reached for Joe's neck, said, Daddy, Daddy, take me to work with you. Joe leaned over and playfully patted him on the head. He says, Daddy has a busy day ahead, son. Maybe you can go another time. But Daddy, Daddy, I, I don't have to go to school today. He says, I know, Joe said. But not this morning. Don't you want me to, to get all my work done so I can stay home with you on Christmas? Yippee, Mikey shouted. Let me give you a kiss so you can hurry and come back. Joe reached over, and Mikey kissed him on the cheek with a resounding smack. Just then he heard Stevie, their 10-year-old, hollering from the upstairs. Wait, Daddy, wait, Daddy, he shouted. I've got something I want to show you before you leave. Joe looked at me and raised his eyebrow. What's he got? I've got to get going, he said. Well, Stevie's been working on that huge civil war a Civil War a puzzle since yesterday. I, I guess he's finished it, and he wants to show it to you before you leave. Joe started into the front room when he heard Stevie starting down the steps. Hey, hold it, hold it, Joe shouted. You can't bring that big thing down here. You'll mess it all up. But, Daddy, I want you to see it. Well, just stay right there, Joe grinned. Laying his coat on the arm of the sofa, says, It's easier for Daddy to come up than it is you to come down. Joe bounded up the steps. A moment later, down he went, pu putting his coat on, heading for the door. See you tonight, he said, and the door closed behind him. There are so many million of last-minute things to do, baking, cleaning, decorating. The boys had just swallowed their last mouthful of breakfast when there was a pounding on the back door. Several of the neighbors' kids bundled up in their heavy coats and caps uh, pulled down over their ears and scarves around their chins stood in the driveway saying, Stevie, Mikey, come. Stevie and Mikey ran to the door and peered out. Be out in a minute, they shouted, and running back into the house for their coats and gloves. Man. I bet that's good sliding in the driveway today, I heard my little boys say to one another as they struggled to get dressed. I opened the back door and let them out and then stood momentarily looking through the glass storm door as they began running from the garage towards the sidewalk, slipping and sliding away to the incline. Sometimes one of them, I know one of them fell. I closed the inner door and busied myself in the kitchen. They'll be back shortly. It's just too cold for them to stay out very long. I began humming Christmas uh, carols as I finished my breakfast dishes and mixed up some cookie batter. Twenty minutes later, just as I was sliding the first batch of cookies into the hot oven, the doorbell rang. Wiping my hands on my apron, I went to the front door, still humming under my breath. A neighbor stood there, her coat hastily pulled over her, her house coat and her head wrapped in a bandana to cover her hair curlers. Her face was white and stricken, and she stuttered as she tried to talk. D -d 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 Dora, something has happened. Her words escaped with little puffs of steam coming out of her mouth. I caught my breath, unaware of the cold air that would whipped around me and into the warm house. I go, well, what's wrong? I choked out. She had difficulty getting the words out. She said, two boys. She said, 
have fallen into the pond. I think they're yours. I stood in stunned disbelief. No, I exclaimed. They can't be. They're right outside sliding in the driveway. My heart leaped into my throat as I looked towards the drive as it was empty. Get your coat, she said. I'll show you where. Somehow I managed to get back into the house, grab my coat, and stumble out the door. I hesitated, said, there's no pond around there. I said, you've got to be mistaken. She goes, oh, there is a big pond just beyond the golf course fairway. She said, haven't you ever seen it before? I shook my head as we started running across the frozen golf course. It can't be them, I kept saying, dear God. Please do not let it be them. We ran to the top of the small hill, and there spread out before me was a huge frozen pond. I stood with my hands to my mouth as I looked in horror at the scene below. A crowd of people had gathered on one side of the ice. Two police cars had, with flashing lights were parked close to the water. I saw two men dressed in dark rubber suits with skin diving apparatus strapped to their back. Uh, uh, bending over and putting on their rubber flippers. Then I raised my eyes to that dark, murky hole in the surface of the ice as it peered up at me like the eyes of death. Two sets of tiny footprints ended at the edge of the gaping hole. I saw their playmates huddled together near one of the police cars, and I knew that Stevie and Mikey were under the ice. I wanted to scream. I felt I was losing my mind. It's a dream. It's a nightmare. I'll wake up in a second, I thought, and it'd all be gone, but I knew it would, I wouldn't wake up from that. I knew it wouldn't go away. I knew it was real, and I couldn't stand it. Joe and I were both Catholics, but our spiritual life was void. We had no real faith in God and only attended church because it was required of us. However, almost 10 years before, I had started to listen to Catherine Coleman's radio broadcast. Joe, however, was aggravated because I grew to love the program. And several times, Joe had threatened to smash the radio if I kept listening to that preacher woman. I had heard her voice five times a week for the last 10 years but I never knew how much of an impact her preaching would have upon me until the day I stood at the top of that hill overlooking that frozen lake. I wanted to run down the hill and throw myself into the icy waters with my babies, but was stopped by the voice that said, Be still and know that I am God. I stopped dead in my tracks I felt what I recognized at once was the power of God coming over me. God himself had used Miss Coleman's voice to speak into me in this time of heart-sinking terror. I grew still, almost calm. I bowed my head and waited. Friends helped me back to across the snow-covered fairways to our little house. By the time I got home, the house was filled with people. A local Protestant minister had arrived. Friends and neighbors were hurrying over. All wanted to help, and no one knew what quite to do. Police and then newspaper reporters arrived. The house seemed to be bursting with people, and I felt an old panic begin to return. Please, someone call Joe, I asked. We already have someone responding. Again, I heard Miss Coleman's voice say, as long as God is still on his throne and hears and answers prayers, everything will turn out right. Oh, I wish that could be true. I do believe it, Lord. I must, for I have no other hope. I went to the bedroom and shut the door. The faint wailing of sirens they had found one of the boys. In my mind, I could see a picture of them pulling the small frozen body up through the hole in the ice. 
those ice encrusted mittens, you know, the ones that had the little ducks on the back, flopping lifelessly over the edge of the ice into the water. Those long, silky eyelashes now gazed shut in death. I fell to my knees beside my bed. Dear Jesus, I cried, please carry this burden, for I cannot do it. And as I prayed, I felt a great peace suddenly. I straightened myself up and I said, what is happening to me? This is not me. I should be going insane right now. Why am I so calm? I felt a flow of energy surging through my body. It was enormous strength. I was so strong, I felt I could pick up my house. I had linked my littleness, my nothingness, with the greatness of him. No matter what happens, you will never go down into defeat. If you are linked to Jesus, I heard that running in the back of my mind. Then the door burst open. I turned. Joe was gripping the doorknob. His knuckles were bone white. His face was lifeless with fear. His lips blue with cold and fright. He moved wordlessly. Dear God, how much he looked like little Stevie. I wanted to reach out and draw him to me and tell him everything was going to be all right. Instead, I calmly said, it's the boys. Are they all right? He screamed frantically. I said, no. Came my quiet response. They've drowned. Joe turned and ran through the door. I wondered if he had heard the sirens, if he had passed the ambulances as he came home towards us. What had been his thoughts as he drove up to the front of the house, finding our house filled with people? What agony my husband was now enduring? I followed him into the living room in time to see him shove the minister against the wall, saying, I don't want any minister. I want my boys. He stumbled across the room, his body racked in convulsive sobs and collapsed on the couch. He stumbled across the room, his body racked in convulsive slob, uh, sobs, and, uh, and, and, and as a young priest from our church arrived. He thanked the minister and told him that he would handle things from there. And moving towards Joe, he hesitated and put his hand on his shoulder. He said, you know, they don't prepare us for stuff like this in seminary, he said. Joe was crushed, his heart broken. He was lost. I knew he didn't know a single verse of scripture in the Bible. All he knew was the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary, and that was not enough at this time, and I knew that. God had given me, though, a double portion of his strength to meet the needs of that hour. I could not believe it was me. There were many things to be done. Someone must identify the children. Someone had to make the funeral arrangements. Someone had to answer the reporter's questions. Someone had to talk to the police. Please, God, grant me strength to do it all and the calmness and keep sanity. Joe was sitting on the sofa, crying and wringing his hands. His brother-in-law was trying to comfort him, but he was incoherent and delusional. The police gave us the details. Mikey had fallen through the ice, and Stevie, seeing his, him disappear into the icy water, ran to him crying, My brother, my brother! And when he got to the hole, the ice broke and swallowed him up with Mikey. The pond was 30 feet deep. It took them almost an hour to find both their bodies. A neighbor took us to the hospital to make the identification of the boys. Joe collapsed in, collapsed in the hospital corridor, and they had to give him medication. I stayed by his side while our neighbor viewed the bodies and made a positive identification. We had arrived home. When we arrived home, the funeral director met us at the door. Once again, I felt as if I were outside of myself looking on as an object, yet invisible outsiders, while the 98-pound body of mine was functioning flawlessly. 
I remember hearing Joe saying, God, God, what is holding, what is holding you up, Dora? Little did he know that it actually was God. Joe staggered into the kitchen and poured himself a shot of whiskey. Mom and Dad arrived, and seeing Joe's condition, Daddy, uh, Dad wisely hid the, his hunting guns. While I sat on the sofa talking with the funeral director, Joe wander, wandered aimlessly room to room as if looking for something. He was totally unable to accept what had happened to us. The next morning, the cars from the funeral home arrived. They were ready for us to go with them to see our sons. It was terribly cold with snow flurries blowing around the car as we pulled into the driveway of the funeral chapel. The directors urged us to go on and view the boys before our friends arrived. This is the hardest part to see them like this. Again, I felt this great strength though flow through me, over me, and around me. I knew I was in the presence of Jesus. There was Mikey, eight years old, with dark hair on the right side of the room. Stephen, ten years old, and with his oh so blonde hair, was there on the left. I walked over to Stevie and put my hand on his shoulder. Again, I could hear Miss Coleman's voice talking about the death of her own beloved father. It looks like him, she said, but it's only a shell. I looked up and thanked Jesus for his presence with me. I felt his great love and compassion around me and could literally feel him, Jesus, weeping with me. I walked over to Mikey, who was lying in an identical white casket. We always got the two the same of everything. Then I looked at Joe, who was standing beside me. His face etched in grief. He was trying to speak. I could see his lips moving with no words coming out. I stood close to him, hugging his arms with both hands. What is it, honey? I whispered. Whatever it takes to get me where they are, I'll do it, Joe sobbed. They're so innocent. And then, for the first time in our married life, I heard Joe pray. Oh, God, make me so innocent in your sight. As these little boys, I want to go where they are. Suddenly, Joe's last words to Stevie on that morning before he left the house flashed through my mind. It's easier for Daddy to come up than it is for you to come down. Perhaps I thought this is what it was going to take for us both. The days that followed were filled with shadows. The funeral was Saturday at St. Matthew's Church followed by a burial service in the freezing wind. Walking back into the kitchen, I gazed at the little gifts the boys had made at school, still on the countertop where they had carefully placed them the morning that they died. To the best mom and dad in the world, one of the couples said. The shadows deepened and turned into night. Christmas floated past, and so did New Year's Eve. Joe had always gone out and... and, and whooped it up, but this year he sat home in the silence of the house and cried in the darkness. Everything in the house was filled with memories. The empty chairs at the dinner table, the rumpled clothes in the bottom of their closets, the drawers filled with little boys' underwears and mismatched socks, things like rocks and bottle caps and empty gun shells, children's books seemed everywhere in the house. Then came the first day of school in the new year, when I had to go to the classroom and clean out their desks, their pencils, their scribbled papers, their workbooks, Mikey's big box of crayons. That's all that now is left of them. But there were memories, oh, the memories. That afternoon as I stood in the living room, I heard the school bus stop by the street, and I heard the shouting and laughing of children coming home, and I just knew that my boys were with them, and I looked out the window, and, but they were not there. On the third day, as I was pulling the drape shut, I heard the same radio voice whispering softly, it's not what happens to you that counts. It's what you do with what you have left. 
Thank you, God, I breathed and opened the drapes, determined to rise from my grief. It wasn't so with Joe, though. He cried all the time. He's unable to return to work. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He couldn't even dress himself. He did, all he did was walk through the lonely home, wringing his hands and crying. At breakfast table, he would break into uncontrollable sobs. He was losing weight, and he was chain-smoking himself to death. I tried to get him to listen to Miss Coleman's daily radio broadcasts, but his mind was too ravaged with grief to understand. Sometimes he'd sit at the table and try to listen, but would break out in great sobs in the middle of the program. And I was deeply concerned about him, for it was as though he had completely lost his direction of life. His hair began to fall out. He looked horrible with sunken cheeks and bloodshot eyes. Then to cap it all off came the boils. Just like Job in the Bible, his body became covered with huge agonizing sores. No one can imagine the torture and turmoil that badgered his body and grief-stricken minds. He resigned his position as vice president of the Television Technicals Association, and he threatened to sell his television business, even going as far as taking out an advertisement. He had lost all incentive to work, to laugh, and to live. It was weeks and weeks before he was able to drag himself back to, to the job. Then one afternoon, a mailman, a chap Joe knew only slightly, stopped by the shop on his rounds, and he expressed sympathy over Joe's loss, and then he said the most strangest thing to him. Mr. Lutz, are you trusting in the Lord? At first, Joe was insulted, then he was embarrassed. But he saw the obvious sincerity on the part of the mailman and answered, Yes, I'm closely related to a church. That, I didn't say church, Joe. The little mailman said kindly. I said, I asked you if you were trusting in Jesus. It hit Joe like a ton of bricks. This was the first time in his whole life that anyone had ever separated the church from Jesus. This was the first time he had ever heard that there might be two different things in going to church and having a relationship with Jesus. And Joe came home that afternoon and told me what an impression that mailman had on him. Oh, the priest came by and said, perhaps you need to pray to your dead children. The Protestant minister came by and said, have you tried the 23rd Psalm? But for the first time, someone suggested that he tried Jesus Christ. Joe began to talking to the mailman every morning as he made his routine deliveries. And one day, the mailman brought him a small gospel of St. John to read. And Joe was impressed. That night, I heard him rummaging around the attic. I said, what are you doing up there? Holler. He says, I know we've got one up here somewhere. And a moment later, he came stumbling down the stairs with an old Bible under his arm. I knew we had one somewhere. That radio preacher later, lady of yours, says, if you stick with the Bible, you can't go wrong. So I'm going to start reading the Bible now. His voice broke, and he began to sob. If there's anything I can do to go to my boys, then I'm willing to do it. So began his intense search and search that led down one blind alley after another until he emerged into the sunlight on the other side of the valley of the shadow. Joe was getting up every morning and go to Mass at St. Matthew's, and he was listening to every radio preacher bombarded on the airwaves, and he even followed up on some of the radio preachers and went to their offices where they prayed for him. He left no stone unturned to reach God, and then one night, several months later, I told him I had finally broken down and written Catherine Coleman a letter. Well, what did you write her, he asked. I told her how she had been with me during the darkest hours of my life, I answered truthfully. And that her life for Christ had been given me new hope. Well, maybe you've got hope, Joe says, but I've got nothing. I tried to comfort him, but he got up from the table and walked back into the living room. He says, do you know what happens to me this afternoon? He says, I'm driving around 
crying all the time. In fact, I was working on a lady's TV set, and I pulled it out, and there was a little toy dump truck under it, and I just broke down, and I began to cry. I cannot think about anything but that and our loss. Two weeks later, Joe came home from work and says, um, you know that lady preacher that you like so much? I said, yeah. She says, she's going to be at O'Neill's department store tomorrow to autograph a book that she's written. Why don't we just go see her, the husband said. I could hardly believe my ears. Catherine Coleman was going to be in Akron, Ohio. And Joe, my husband, who had one time threatened to smash the radio as I was listening to her, is now asking me to go see her with him. We were there early, but the line already extended out into the streets. We stood uh, watching her signed autographs and books, and I couldn't get my eyes off her. She was so vibrant and radiant and full of joy. Then we were the next ones. We introduced ourselves, and I said, Maybe you don't remember, but I wrote you a letter several weeks ago, and I told you how much you had blessed us after our boys drowned. Oh, she raised from the table. Of course I remember. I have been praying for you. How could I forget that wonderful touching letter? Then before we could reply, she put one hand on my head and the other on Joe's shoulder, and she began to pray out loud. And right there in the middle of O'Neill's department store, she prayed for our salvation and for the Holy Spirit to descend upon us. We walked out of the store Joe's face was radiant he put his arm around my shoulder and said honey Sunday we're going down to hear that preacher lady in Youngstown he got up early the next Sunday and we went to the early mass as usual then we came back by the house and we drove to the service in Youngstown after the first service we knew that if there was an answer to our spiritual search we could find it in her ministry we kept attending Coleman services in Youngstown and I began to notice a change taking place in my husband's heart. He stopped smoking. And then one day when I was upstairs, I heard him banging and scraping in the basement. And I looked out the window and he was dragging his homemade bar out of the basement. And he lit it on fire in the, <laughs> in the driveway. And we both stood there watching it burn. Several times after the services, Joe would talk, turn to me and said, You know, I almost went forward this morning when she called. But something keeps holding me back. <laughs> then in March of 1963, 15 months after the loss of Mikey and Stevie, whatever it was that was holding Joe back turned loose. We were standing side by side during the altar call by Mrs. Coleman when Joe turned to me and said, I am ready now. Will you go with me? And that... I hugged his arms as we stepped out of the aisle and started forward. I could hear Joe weeping as we walked down that long aisle and joined the crowd in the front of the auditorium. We stood at, at, as close to the podium as we could, and I heard Joe sob saying, Jesus, I'm so sorry. And no one will ever know the joy that swept through my soul at that very moment. I could feel Joe was being born again, becoming anew in Jesus Christ. And then I felt the soft hand on my shoulder and looked up, and there was Miss Coleman with that ever-present smile urging us to come forward and speak in the microphone. She urged us forward, and we stood found, found ourselves facing a crowd of 5,000 people with the microphone. And she said to us, why did you all come forward? Miss Coleman, Joe said, his voice crackling but strong, I have to see my boys again. I just have to be ready so I can be with my sons again. You can see your sons again, Miss Coleman said. You can be with them through all eternity if you will give your heart to Jesus Christ. And from that, and, and for that, is where they are. They are with Jesus. I gripped Joe's arm so tightly I was afraid I would cut off his circulation. 
as he turned to that crowd of 5,000 people, he said, Today I announce that I take Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And as he said that, the glory came down that day. We've been through some ups and downs since, but things keep getting brighter and brighter. And I thank Lord Jesus for taking us through those situations and seeing us through. And I do remember the most prophetic thing of the whole time are the words my father said to our little son. It's easier for daddy to come up than it is for you to come down. And when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, <laughs> we get to go up. And be with those who have gone before. Amen. Not only easier is it. But it's far more glorious. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father. That's what baby Jesus came about. He came to grow up. To carry the cross. To take our sins. To die in our place. To be raised from the dead. So we could have an eternity with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and those who go before. And I pray here today, Lord, people whose hearts are, 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 are hurt and have holes in it, we pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, to fill those holes right now with a great peace and assurance of who we are in you. And pray for our families that we be able to see them. So, Lord, we say Merry Christmas. And thank you for the greatest gift of Jesus because we will have a tomorrow for those who go before, have gone before, and have been attached to you. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. Let us sing our final hymn. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve each other. May keep the reason for the season with you all the time. Amen. We love you. We need you. God is with you. And you are not alone. Hope and pray you have a great rest of this week and a happy, happy New Year's to you. For God is good. And all the time, God bless you.